Okay, so here we are. We're doing a very unusual Web Wednesday. We're doing it across borders, across the sea, and across the internet. I'm standing in my home office in Mawan Island on Hong Kong, in Hong Kong. And we're talking across the waters to Henry O, oh, who is an old friend of Web Wednesday and is based in downtown, uptown San Francisco. Where are you exactly? Uh, I'm in the Mission in San Francisco, so yeah. Good place to be. So um, we, you know, you and I have been talking a while and we wanted to basically compare notes between what's happening in the technology world uh, uh, in, in Asia and Hong Kong, particularly Hong Kong, China, and what's happening uh, in the US and how, how it's all been, you know, changed and muddled, et cetera, by the COVID-19 scenario that we're all facing. So, um, you know, you were, you, as far as I remember, you were back in Hong Kong uh, in 2005 and you turned up at a few Web Wednesdays. So maybe we could just, we could just start there with uh, what, what, what brought you to Hong Kong originally and how did you get involved with the, the technology world here? Yeah, I would be happy to. It's for me an honor to, to be doing Web Wednesday again with you, Napoleon, because Web Wednesday was so important in many ways to my career in tech. When I first moved to Hong Kong, I thought I was gonna be writing a book about the Hong Kong underworld. You know, I spent time in the library, I was meeting with shady people. And, uh, you know, through a, a, a chain of happenstance where I was talking to the director of the tour project who introduced me to Rebecca McKinnon, who used to run CNN in Asia and then was teaching journalism at HKU and was working on a Creative Commons project to bring Creative Commons license to Hong Kong. She recommended that I go to Web Wednesday as part of, you know, getting myself acquainted with the digital internet startup world in Hong Kong. And I went to that Web Wednesday, met you, got a job offer from Yacht to write Hello Kitty episodes, turned it down. And then irony is I ended up doing Hello Kitty, uh, BD for Hello Kitty apps like five years later. You know? BD so, for Hello Kitty, I like that. You should have, I think you've got the wrong t-shirt on. You should be wearing a Hello <laughs> Kitty t-shirt. It kind of makes you softer. But um, the, the yeah. Creative Commons world is an interesting one too, because you know, we, we, in the early days of the internet, there was all these business models that people were trying to discover in terms of when you create content, do you own it? Do you share it? How do you monetize it? How do you get other people to play with it? What I, what I, one of the things that I found fascinating about the current kind of lockdown environment we're living in is the amount of creativity that is coming, you know, whether it's memes or stupid, silly videos or, even, you know, even all of these very productive, uh, particularly in, you know, in, in China or, or, or across the world, but the ones that, that come across my radar is, you know, you've got professional artists, whether it's Saturday Night Live or whatever you've got in, this, in the States, but they're taking, you know, they're creating content out of their own bedrooms, their own offices, their own. So it's really interesting where this is going because there's a whole, I think, you know, out of the back of this, we're going to realize that the content element is massive. But I also think there's going to be questions about the business models. And I mean, if, what I remember with the Creative Commons, the challenge was, you know, is it attribute, attributable or who owns it? And if you use it, do you have to attribute somebody or can you share the money from it? So I don't know. It's, it's very interesting to see that where that's going to go. Um, because, you know, like a lot of these conferences online, originally, you know, we all started in the offline world where you do a training and you get paid to do a training. And now you're online and you kind of wonder, should I, you know, should the screen suddenly freeze and go e -uh, to continue pay now? Right. So it's, <laughs> I'm wondering whether that will be Zoom's business model. I don't know. But let's talk a bit about, um, you know, so we, we were what was fascinating in, in Hong Kong was, you know, you get to watch both Western uh, kind of American based Internet companies and Chinese based Internet companies. And you, you know, if you speak the language or read it like I do you can dabble in, dip into both, right? And what I found here was that the Chinese internet companies very quickly were up and running with data around uh, what was happening with, the, with the, the virus and how it was spreading and how to, how to react to it. And they started off with the statistics, right? You had the numbers from Alibaba who was putting out maps and statistics of people catching it and you know, recovering and all this stuff. And then they, quickly went into, you know, how to help yourself, how to, uh, you know, connect with a doctor to see if you had it. And then it went into the areas that are much better, which is selling stuff, right? They started selling vegetables and masks 
you know, alcohol wipers, whatever. How have you seen the, the US tech companies react to this? Because from, from our perspective here in Asia, it seems to have been really slow. Yeah, I think the coronavirus and the responses in China versus the US do a good job in highlighting a dif the differences between a centralized government that is tightly coordinating with private sector actors that it has a long history of collaborating or controlling versus a decentralized model that the US represents where you have 50 states uh, in different governors in the different states really driving what's happening on the ground. You have mayors of cities, you have uh, you know, the president, you have senators, people in Congress, but really it's the mayors and the governors that are affecting the day-to-day -day reality of the citizens. And I think in Northern California, it was, you know, I feel very blessed and fortunate to be here because the mayor, London Mayor Bree, was very, very early in doing a shelter in place order. And right now there's a lot of articles coming out in the United States comparing the relative uh, low number of cases in the Bay Area to New York and some of the other places and really you know, giving credit to the earlier lockdown that Mayor Breed put into place. Like she you know, actually did it before the governor of California did it. And I think that that's something to be said about data literacy you know, in the Bay Area with all these tech people and, um, you know, a, a culture and an environment where people are very, you know, science and data minded, it was a lot easier for leadership here and the people running public health and the other services to be able to look at data, understand it and not get bogged down into politics or thinking that it's a vast Where, where were you getting your data from? Was it coming from, were you looking at the Chinese data and going, okay, so you know, this is what's happening in China and, and it's spreading in, in Southeast Asia, then we should do something about it? Or was it your own homegrown data that, that, that was being used as a reference, do you know? There was an interesting article that I read about a week ago that looked at the Director of Public Health for Santa Clara and the role that she played in the response in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And she comes across as a very well-respected person who in many ways seems very Silicon Valley or Bay Area-ish. Like, she is someone who was educated at Stanford, um, has connections to a lot of leaders in the Bay Area because she's been in her position for decades. And they had actually done some uh, preparation to a pandemic type of scenario, right? So we see this with South Korea and their response. They were able to kind of take their recent experience with MERS. And because they had that experience, they had a contingency plan in place that they're able to draw from. And everyone was on the same page about what needed to be done. Mm -hmm. I think likewise, Santa Clara and these officials had done some work in the past, kind of scenario mapping or planning for what would be done in the case of some sort of pandemic, right? And so I think, in the early stages and still where we're at is in the absence of widespread testing in the absence of a lot of data people are just doing the measures that are the most conservative right that regardless of how infectious it is and regardless of what the demographic looks like a shelter in place order is a very blunt instrument well, what exactly is to a, what do you call it a shelter in place order is that what it's called so yeah that's yeah that's where you're so, saying lockdown yeah, i mean it, it, it's not a strict restriction to stay at home under all circumstances, but it's basically only leave your house if, you know, under certain conditions or if it's extremely important, um, right? People can still go outside to exercise. People can still, you know, take walks around their neighborhood. People can still go to the grocery store. Um, it's, it's, it's not like, we have, I mean, it's kind of, it's similar to what we have here in Hong Kong, which is, and well, you're not, you're not on lockdown, right? In Hong Kong, you're, you're a lot of people are still going to work wearing masks, um, no school, of course, but you can go to restaurants and they have tables with big X's on them that like to keep oh. in between, apart from each other. And, uh, you know, you can still do that. So it's very different. But I'm wondering, going back to the tech side, were you from San Francisco? Were you seeing a lot of, you know, what the Chinese tech companies were doing and saying, hey, you know, this, this is interesting. You know, they're really getting involved or was that you weren't really getting that kind of, you weren't really getting that, that, you on, on what was happening in China? Was it more the news around, around health or did you actually look, did you see anything coming from the tech world? Because I think we've seen here that, that the technology world has really stepped up, right? They've really stepped up. And 
I, I'm only just seeing it, you know, seeming to happen with the kind of the Googles, the Facebooks, the, the you know, the Twitters, the LinkedIn's of this world. So I, I mean, you're there and maybe, you, you know, you work, well, you work with a lot of these companies, right? Your, your company, Tenjin, is looking at data, but you're looking from a mobile perspective and mobile apps and stuff. So I'm just curious, you know, on two levels, you know, the big guys and then what's happening in the kind of more entrepreneurial tech world. Yeah, I had visibility uh, into what was going on in China just because I was interested in a lot of the tracking and surveillance technologies that were being deployed. You know, whenever, like when 9-11 happened, everyone talked about how it was going to change the world. And I think maybe I was a little bit too young to really take it that seriously about the world changing impact of it. But I remember at the time with 9-11, people were talking about the erosion of civil liberties and how privacy was going to be impacted by, you know, the fight against terrorism. And sure enough, you know, you can see, you know, 10, 20 years later, the real impact on privacy by a lot of the technologies that were deployed mm -hmm. to combat terrorism, right? And so for me, with the coronavirus, I was very interested and mindful of the type of surveillance technologies that were being deployed uh, to, to deal with this, right? Yeah, and so about like the facial recognition and the, the facial recognition with a mask. And you're like, what? Really? Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, and, and like ankle trackers or like people getting devices put on them to track whether they're complying with quarantine or not. Use of, you know, cell phone data, you know, provided by mobile yeah. carriers or app carriers and for big data mining and things like this. Like these are all things that can be repurposed once the coronavirus is over for much more political or law enforcement uh, enforcement ends, right? Um, just combating drug trafficking, for instance, like these yeah. type of technologies that maintained and rolled out like could really make it difficult for drug trafficking in the yeah. future for instance right um so what i've observed is that you know the big companies here in silicon valley were very early in issuing the work from home order um i think even before mayor breed issued uh the shelter in place or before the bay area wide shelter in place order was given a lot of the companies had already taken steps to have so they're doing but that's for their own stuff right they're just saying you know, shelter at home, whatever. That that's more of a of a of a process for their own stuff. They're not really applying their technology to to the wider population, right? I, I would guess that they're doing it because they also have presence in China. And in all, all of them have big offices, including Google actually, large operations in China. So they would probably be seeing what's happening there and saying, damn, this is serious. Right? right. But I, I'm wanting more from the application of their technology. Yeah, and I think the difference in what, from what I've seen is that the business models are different. Like Facebook and Google make primarily their money from advertising. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the way in which they view what's happening is much more through the lens of how it affects advertising dollars and it affects yeah. advertising. Um, you know, I think usage of the Facebook platform is way up. Um, and so I think they're seeing an impact there. And they all have taken steps I think the biggest step that these companies have all taken is in content moderation and filtering. Yeah. After the 2016 election, there was a lot of criticism leveled at Facebook and Twitter, especially for allowing their services and platforms to be used to spread misinformation or disinformation. Yeah. And so right now, a year before the presidential election, a lot of them had put measures in place in anticipation of, you know, the same sorts of things happening during the presidential election. And they're, deploying it a little early for COVID and they're taking down apps, Twitter is removing tweets, Facebook is, you know, removing uh, postings, eBay is removing things, Amazon is removing things like, you know, they're, they're playing the role of content police, whether it's in the goods that they sell or the information that they're conveying, they're playing a much more active role in controlling what information gets sent via their platform. I That's think, interesting. They I think the they're, do, they're doing that. You, you think they're doing that as, a, as doing good on one side, but also as a protective mechanism to protect their core business models? You mean from the advertising? If they, if they do that, then they feel that they're going to be, you know, genuine, considered as genuine, you know, vehicles to transmit political messages, or you think it's a, it's a kind of house cleaning activity that they're doing? I think there's a general sensitivity across all U.S. corporations right now about doing things that will cement a bad reputation during this moment of crisis. You know, it's kind of like 
how people are extra sensitive to how people treat them in their moment of need. Yeah. You know, I think right now people are looking at, you know, do Arc is laying people off? Like how are people acting as corporate actors and as responsible members of society? Like, are they trying to keep their staff employed? Are they continuing health benefits? Are they returning money for like auto insurance? There's some auto insurance companies that are returning money to their premium holders because people are driving less. And other auto insurance companies are just saying, we'll, we'll just take, keep the money. Um, and so these are the sorts of things that can affect lifelong relationships that people have with these companies. And I think Facebook, Google, Twitter, and you know, to a lesser extent, Snapchat and some of these other uh, platforms don't want blame put on them afterwards. If, if for some reason, you know, a million people die, they don't want a finger in it back to them to say this information that you helped spread led to the deaths of a million Americans. That's interesting. Yeah. So the information part is quite, <laughs> it's like information dilution or I don't know, just like you said, the moderation of it. It's very, very interesting. And I think we, we didn't see that here because the information was more, it was just assumed that it's coming from these platforms. It's already kind of pre-vetted, right? We know mm -hmm. it's pre-vetted or censored. But we also yeah. know that, you know, it's a lot of the information was more around, I mean, of course, there were reactions that happened on the internet here when, you know, doctors and things were, were labeled as the wrong people. And then obviously there's a, there's a movement there, but I'm, you don't, the, the attention is not so much to the reputation of the platforms. I think here it's more like they're part of us, you know, they wanted to show their mm -hmm. ingrained in society. I mean, we have in here in Hong Kong, we have an e-commerce company called HKTV, which uh, called TV because they try to get a TV license, weren't given it, so they then came a mall, right? Ooh, I like well, these things. Yeah, I like them. Sorry. I like the things. You're, getting dark. <laughs> You're getting dark on it. Keep it, keep it, it's good. Um, so whilst you're fixing that, I'll just say, so HKTV Mall, you know, we're losing money hand over fist. And now, now that, um, you know, we're all ordering from home, their, their business has just gone, has skyrocketed, right? So they, but they've established themselves as, you know, being very, a very trusted, they're becoming a very trusted brand. It's really interesting to see where that's going, right? And, you know, they've had a few hiccups. They, they, they increased the minimum delivery uh, number because they've got too many orders and then they realized that backfired, so they brought it down. But I was, I was thinking, more about you know what you're what you're seeing kind of on your you know your the tech startup community you know that level because you've got the big guys you know I see I see Google starting to offer data kind of for, for maps and I, I see there's been some studies coming out I don't know if it's Google but there's some interesting studies coming out of mapping you know you're seeing academic groups and one thing that I respect in states is that the universities the, a lot of this thought leadership comes from the academia right which is very closely mm -hmm. knitted into the corporates. But the idea that you're able to use mobile data to track you know, where people came from and where the spread came, but it's very historical, it seems. It's not solving future problems. But um, yeah, I was just wondering where you see it on your level, because you know, you're dealing with, as you, may, you, can t you can tell us a little bit more about what you do on a, daily level, on a daily job, but you're dealing with the app development community, the gaming community. Just tell us what you see in that area. Yeah, I always think more generally regarding entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, I think it's a hard time because one, if you were working on something where you're looking for funding and you were planning on getting funding, you know, in the beginning of 2020, it's a very, I think, difficult environment. Um, a lot of the ways in which you would normally get funding, you know, meeting people for coffee, uh, talking to people, networking, those sorts of things sort of go away. I think also investors who have money into companies a lot of them are telling com companies to uh, reduce their burn, aka lay people off, conserve cash, and so that when this uh, coronavirus uh, you know, uh, time goes away, they're in a better position and they have more cash rather than having burned a lot of cash in the interim. So I think in general, the startup environment, it, it's not an environment where I would be wanting to raise money, but I think some people look at it as an opportunity and a, and a time of opportunity. I think. Gaming companies, initially, everyone is staying at home, there was a, a spike in advertising activity to acquire users. Like uh, Tengen provides data infrastructure to mobile marketers. They use Tengen to figure out if they run ads on Facebook, Google, App Lovin, Iron Source. If they run ads for people to install their app, 
will those users who install the app make money for them? Will they watch ads or make in-app purchases, right? So you're looking so, beyond the installs, you're looking to what they do afterwards and will they, you're looking at where, where they started, when they installed it and what they do afterwards, was it, was it worth, worth that journey or that investment, right? Exactly, and, and it sounds like a simple thing, but in actuality, like answering that question, you know, is my advertising campaign ROI positive, yeah. is a very hard thing to answer. Like, you know this from working yeah. in marketing, like yeah. sounds simple, very hard. Um, so what we're seeing is that actually our, the number of events that we process has gone up almost 50%. What so, do you mean by events? The events that you so if, events can be an app open and install custom events. Like people will often oh, okay. track custom events to tie that back to marketing. So if there's a tutorial complete or finish level three or, yeah. uh, you know, do some action of significance in the game and they want to be able to optimize your marketing for users that do that thing, right? Like if it was e-commerce, they'd want to understand how many users place something in a shopping cart from this campaign. It's like a point of conversion. You're attributing it to a particular, okay. Exactly. Um, And so we process events for, you know, uh, sessions, um, you know, various things that happen in the game. Those all generate events. And so we're seeing events go up because people are playing games more. They're spending more time in game. Um, but at the same time, you, we can see that some companies have stopped doing advertising. They've pulled back on, or they've dramatically reduced the amount of advertising that they do. Um, some companies, on the other hand, are looking at as an opportunity for a land grab. And these tend to be more of the dominant players, right? Yeah. Like, I think what's happening now really puts people who have cash at an advantage, whether it's in investing or in games or whatever, whoever has cash right now is in a better position than those who don't, yeah. right? And, and they're leveraging that advantage in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and in the gaming area, primarily it's land grab. You wanna get users, you wanna get them on your games, you want them to understand, get to like your games, and you wanna build brand loyalty during this time. But are you seeing, I mean, are you seeing this, you say it's the big guys, so are the big guys, you know, I know that like Tencent owns a lot of gaming companies like Riot Games and uh, Friends, right? Mm-hmm. Is it is it the big guys that kind of level when you say the big guys or are you are you are the rather I mean I don't know the gaming world as well as you do or the mobile gaming world but is it is it that kind of level of big guy or are you talking you know just game aggregators I mean how how does it work in the, in the mobile gaming world So for the last couple of years the top free charts on both iOS and Android have been dominated by what they call hyper casual games Okay So you remember casual games back in 2010, management, restaurant management, you know, sorts of games. Those were called casual games. Hyper casual are games that are very short gameplay, like Centipede. Like, you know, remember that game Centipede back in the yeah. day where there's a little like yeah. Centipede that comes down the screen and you're kind of just trying to break it into pieces. A lot of the hyper casual games remind me of Atari games, you know, back in the early 80s, like very short gameplay sessions, very, very simple. But these games have dominated the top three charts on both iOS and Android for the past couple of years and really has surprised a lot of uh, gaming experts, you know, because gaming experts always think better graphics, more sophistication, you know, they're thinking like very like polished sorts of games. Whereas these hyper casual games are very rough around the edges. They don't have great graphics. Like, you know, it's really about gameplay design. They show a lot of ads. And I think for a lot of, you know, gaming experts, they're very surprised that these games have users, yeah. right? And I, I think the industry, the, the current explanation in the industry is that a lot of people who did not otherwise play games are playing these hyper-casual games. And are these so women, games on the way to work? I mean, is it because of the commute, the kind of commute type thing? Or is it, you know, board school children? Or what, what is the driver between behind this? Yeah, there's been a lot of different theories. I mean, if it was just commute, then you would expect to see more hyper casual downloads and better uh, play in places that have public transportation or where people have like idle time during commute. And you would see lower numbers in areas where people are driving to work, for instance, because ideally you're not playing a game while you're driving to work, yeah, right? To um, <laughs> but, but so far the data doesn't seem to show anything like that. It seems to be that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, women, uh, older people, younger people who are playing these games. And a lot of it seems to be traveling via word of mouth. Um, and so 
it, and it's still, I don't think something that the entire industry has figured out. Like it's one of these trends that people keep waiting to die and it doesn't die. So more people hop on board the trend. Are these, are these games, and are these games played on an individual basis or are they people challenging each other? Because I, what I've seen happen during the, the kind of the COVID lockdown, work from home, whatever situation you're in, is there seem to be a lot more people, you know, going on and having these kind of calls, but even playing games during these calls, right? There's other mm. house party or whatever they use for games. My brother has poker nights, you know, on a regular day in Auckland using one of these platforms. So, <clears throat> but you're talking about people doing it on mobile phones. So are these, are these communal games or are they, are they just one single player? Interesting. And how they're, you they're mostly sing sorry, they're mostly single player games. And I think whichever hyper casual company can figure out how to make them more social will, you know, do quite well. But so far, no one's really done that. Yeah. And how you I mean, your data that you're looking at, are you looking at on a global perspective? Or is it very US centric? Are you are you pulling data from the, the app stores? So then you're uh, and the game developers themselves? I mean, what, what kind of perspective do you have when you look at this data? Yeah, we pull data, we get the data from the app developers. Uh, okay. You know, we have an SDK that sits on the device um, and uh, that provides insight into various activities that the developer wants uh, to, to understand. Uh, so, and in terms of whether we're just US or global, about 40% of our data comes from Europe, about 40% comes from North America and about 20% from Asia currently. So have you, have you seen, you know, as, as this disease proceeds across the world, have you seen kind of habits being replicated and numbers being replicated? Or could you almost look at it and say, oh, look, people are now spending less time. I'm wondering what it would look like. You know, all these curves we're seeing on the internet, the bell, you know, everybody's talking mm -hmm. about politicians are getting excited about. <clears throat> Is, uh, you know, are you seeing the same kind of, I wonder if the same habits are being replicated or could be read into uh, on the data that you get from mobile games because you know we all know a mobile phone is a very personal thing right and we all mm -hmm. probably the first thing that people do when they're stuck at home is they just you know slouch slouch on the couch and you know have the mobile phone in place right so or even when on, on zoom calls they're busy playing video games on, on their phone mm -hmm. so i'm just curious have you seen oh, i don't know if you're going down to that level of analytics but if you're seeing this any telltale signs in the data yeah, because when this was happening in Asia, like you said, it was hitting China very hard in January, uh, February, and not, you know, wasn't really affecting Europe or the U.S. very much during January, February. We just the rise in traffic that we're seeing now in terms of the events that we're processing. So we're definitely seeing differences between when it gets hit, when Europe gets hit, North America gets hit, versus when Asia got hit in terms of the, the effect that it has. And then one thing that we're seeing here that's quite interesting is the um, <clears throat> is governments now are trying to you know support the industry. So um, we you know does it just released a, a big budget here? It's typically unclear. They're saying they're going to encourage part of the money is going to go to help companies digitize or get you know deal with all this remote working. And I'm wondering is the are you seeing the same in the states or is this coming down to kind of like you said is this happening on a on a, a governor level or a where, where they're saying, look, you know, we've got huge IT uh, industry in California, Silicon Valley. You know, we need to make sure these people keep their jobs. We need to, because the, the problem with the technology world I see is that it's already made up of a lot of people who work on contract, right? You're not necessarily mm -hmm. salaried, right? You're, a, you're yeah. either a, a, a free agent who kind of takes gigs. You know, it's a very gig economy type. The tech mm -hmm. world, particularly Silicon Valley, is like the king of gigs, right? I mean, it's yeah. all about gigs. So how is that working? What's the, what's the support mechanism for, for these types of folk? Yeah, I think, again, it's a lot decentralized and it's really much more of a patchwork rather than being led by the government uh, or led by a central authority. So what I'm seeing on a personal level is people finding ways to adapt to the new reality or circumstance. And some people manage that, some people don't, right? Anytime that there's some sort of large event that affects society, there are some people who can adapt to it and some people who can't. And I think it accelerates the, the kind of shift in power 
between those who can use technologies and those who can't, right? Those who are able to do things online or virtually and have the ability to be somewhat savvy about how they do that versus not. And I'll give you an example. Like I have a friend who worked in mobile um, and, and tech who recently uh, for the past few years has been doing circus performing. Like that's her first love and passion is doing circus performing, right? And she went from being a, a rock star in the tech world to being a, you know, a rock star in the, the circus performing world. And she had all these gigs and starting to appear on commercials and advertising. And what then did she, do? she does the, the swinging in, in, in the sky, the kind of that, or is she riding elephants? Or what she, what's kind of circus performing? Does not ride elephants will swing in the sky, will contort her body into strange shapes, you know, like uh, does uh, various like acrobatic trips. It's you to have a friend like that. Yeah, anyway, carry on, carry on. Yes, I understand. <laughs> and, 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 and so when all of her gigs kind of dried up, uh, she was left without an income stream, right? Like all of her commercial work and everything else all stopped because all the production stopped, all of her gigs got canceled. And she had uh, you know, compatriots, uh, circus performers that she worked with in these gigs uh, and doing this work. Mm -hmm. And her being a very savvy kind of tech person started stretching classes online. Like she started offering paid stretching classes, you oh, know, that's... where people join yeah, and they- Charging you know, straight away. She went straight into charging. There was none of this, none of this free stuff that we're all doing. I, I think she might've done a few classes. I think she did a few classes initially for free, yeah. but she was able to like, you know, tra transition her business and her, what she was doing, because she did teach classes also as part of her performance work. Like she taught aerial acrobatics and other things. She was able to transition into this online world where she's, you know, not going to run out of money anytime soon because she's been able to make this transition versus some of her colleagues that, you know, she was telling me, that are having a very hard time making this transition and who are finding it very hard to figure out how to make money in this new reality. And go on. No, so uh, it's interesting. So I didn't let you finish. What you were saying was, so she's doing stretching classes and then what, she, you then pay to, it's like a YouTube type thing or it's a, a you just pay to, to join the class or you download a, how does it work? What do, what do you? I, I, I think she either does it, uh, I think she does it through Venmo. And I think it might be one of those things where you have to, if you send the money, then you get access to the password okay, that gives you access. Thing. So she's a good example of somebody who's gone, you know, into that world, although she did come from the tech world. So I find it fascinating. She's taken her stretches back or her kind of physical back into the digital, which is uh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, this is what I find is interesting now is there's so many people who are trying to transition their, their you know, in the education world particularly, right? There's a lot happening coaching uh you know going online i mean i set up this website 85 do 852 reboot hk because i wanted to, to kind of help small businesses get going and it's surprising like you know maybe 50 percent of the submissions of people who do coaching and training and they're trying to you know move it to an online world um <clears throat> but i don't think that that's very interesting to see and where do you i mean we're here, we're now starting to, well, until very recently, we felt like we were coming out of it, right? You know, in China, already Wuhan has no cases. They're starting to open up the borders a bit here between Hong Kong and China, let people trickle back in. Um, but we're still very much on, on lockdown. Uh, and in terms of, you know, movement, not so much, uh, well, and psychologically. But I, I'm just wondering, where do, you, where do you see this going in your part of the world and the kind of technology, how, what's going to come out of it? Do you have any kind of future gazing moments that you have looking out of your window there? Yeah, actually I do. You know, I think the coronavirus, people have framed it in terms of a test of various systems, whether it's public health, emergency response, uh, even political systems. People compare the benefits of an authoritarian system like China versus, you know, democracies in Europe and the West that seem relatively slow to respond or, you know, models like Singapore, which combine a bit of authoritarianism with, with democracy or uh, free markets. And I think historically, democracies are not asked to respond to things. You know, if you look at in, in the United States, like if you look at its history, has typically been slow to respond to international crises, whether it's World War I, World War II, things often happen outside of the U.S. shores that you know, the U.S. takes its sweet time in kind of responding to and gearing up. I think one of the strengths of the U.S. historically has been 
that once it responds and starts to respond, the decentralized nature of things allows for a lot of innovation and ingenuity in the responses that people have. Individual adaptations that people have are able to become much larger and scale much faster than places where it's authoritarian and it's run from a centralized model, right? And so I think right now, people want to kind of cast their vote sort of right now, and it's still very early on. You know, I saw something today that said COVID and coronavirus might become a seasonal thing. Until there's a vaccine, like it might happen every year. It might be a seasonal thing, right? Yeah. Which if you think about that and you think about, you know, if this goes on three, four, five years, you know, to me, it's not certain that China or Singapore, or these other countries, three, four years out will have responded to this better than the United States will have. Right. I think we're still very early on in the process. You mean to assess and, it too early? Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and so uh, for me, I think my hope lies in the fact that there's a lot of very smart people who have a lot of resources and time now to think of nothing else but how to kind of deal with the problems that coronavirus presents and the coronavirus itself. And I think once this sort of acute period of crisis passes, it will be, you know, that which really separates the countries from how they respond to this. Uh, and so I think that's my hope. But right now, what you're seeing in the U.S. is a lot of dysfunction regionally, depending on the region. You know, I think in the Northern California, we have a Democratic mayor, Democratic governor, and we have a lot of, you know, smart people who don't let politics get in the way of policy in this area. In other parts of the country, like Florida, Texas, um, Tennessee, you see different Re, uh, approaches and so far the data seems to indicate that their outcomes are going to be worse. That's interesting. Yeah, the political side of it is is is. Uh, I'm not usually into politics, but my mind has certainly been opened by you know what's going on here and how how politics really really in this case affects life or death. You know, I mean, it's really slapped me in the face to see how what a difference it makes. Um, I'm also wanted to ask you a little bit about you know what I'm the repurposing of some of these technology companies. I've seen. You know, Apple is kind of making masks. We had in England, we have Dyson, you know, which makes vacuum cleaners, mm -hmm. uh, making ventilators. So you get all these, you know, really interesting experimental inventor type people, you know, who make products and invent products. And they're going, damn, we've got, you know, the design capabilities, the engineering, the manufacturing, the distribution, the customer service. And they just go, let's put it to good. Are you, are you seeing that happening or trickling down on multiple levels? Or is it only, again, is it only the big guys who kind of, do you know any other cases of things happening? I've only read what's in the media from an Apple perspective or Tesla saying that they're going to launch. I don't know exactly what Tesla is going to do, but they're doing stuff too, right? On ventilators, maybe. That was it. Ventilators. Um, so do you see any Ventilators. Uh, yeah, I think the 3D printing community has been really active you know, all the people who have 3D printers, like you can get a 3D printer for $500, $1,000, yeah. but they call them the maker community. Yeah, that's and cool. these, these maker communities have been amazing in terms of turning out emergency supplies, like face oh, shields and, cool. and other things. Yeah, we and so I think you're- about them here. That's very interesting. So they're working together to produce stuff? Yes. So I think what you're seeing is like these like maker communities you know, again, this decentralized model, right? There's no central authority saying you, everybody who has a, 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 a 3D printer needs to make this. Yeah. But you have people using Reddit and other forms of organization to find each other, find the needs, and, you know, kind of step up and fill the void. And so I think if you go uh, on social media, you can just see thousands of examples every day of Americans helping other Americans, not because they're told to by some government, not because, you know, uh, someone with authority told them to, but because they've identified a need, they understand that they have the ability to do something to help fill that need, and they want to help and they're stepping into that. So I also see this in San Francisco, like numerous friends all involved in efforts to source uh, protective equipment and get it to uh, medical uh, personnel that need it. Um, entrepreneurs turning their skills. There was this recent article that I was reading about these two uh, entrepreneurs who were working on a logistics setup, who transitioned their logistics expertise into sourcing N95 masks for the U.S. And so because they knew a lot of people who had warehouses and other people who worked in shipping, they were able to kind of jump right into this and really make a difference. So I think you're also seeing this as well. Do you think the Americans are going to be open to the idea of 
doing like they're doing in China, where you have your QR code that shows whether you're green, red, or orange, you know, whether you're, whether you're ready to go out and face the public. I actually heard, uh, I think it was one of the, uh, the podcasts, one of the, the, the daily podcasts, and I think they're interviewing so, uh, a filmmaker, actually the filmmaker behind um, Contagion, or Contagious, right? Is it called Contagion? Okay. Contagion. And, yeah, and he, uh, he was saying that the, the, the scientist there was saying that actually the idea of having a kind of almost like a passport to say, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm COVID free. So you can have a certain group of the population go out first and then the rest, you know. Do you see that? I mean, you know, there's a lot of media about what's happening in China, but my friends in China are finding it really convenient that they can just walk around, pop into a place, show a QR code. You know, obviously these are the ones that are not, not ill. If it makes the ones, I haven't spoken, luckily not many of them are, but the ones who aren't are probably not so welcome. Uh, but do you see this kind of technology taking off at all, or is it just too anti-American in terms of freedom? I think China was predisposed to embrace that sort of technology because of, you know, Alipay yeah. and, you know, the, the payment platforms that are already there where people were already showing QR codes yeah. to get paid for things. And that transition, you know, had taken place years ago in China, yeah. where it still hasn't even gotten very decent penetration in the U.S. yet. And so, you know, I think people's lack of familiarity familiarity with that is a factor. I think the fact that there's a lot of older Americans who are not very technologically savvy at all, which is very different than Asia. Like I think in Asia, my experience is that a lot of older people in Asia are quite tech savvy and they embrace mobile and digital in ways that are much more sophisticated than you know a lot of average American of comparable age. And so I think that also plays a factor is that in places where there's a lot of elderly people or an older population, the ability to roll something like that out will be, you know, will be limited. But said, if it buys people freedom from a lockdown, that's a very powerful motivator for yeah, exactly. people, right? But then um, it creates, but you're right, it creates, the, it creates that good old digital divide that, you know, I remember last year, the digital divide was becoming a big topic, but now it's kind of got a little bit lost in the, in the morass of what's happening. But I do think there's, it's going to come up again. But uh, we've had a really good chat, and I know we could probably chat for about another two hours. And you've been yes. up all day doing Zoom interviews, and you, you know you haven't faded. So I'm, re I'm really enjoying this. It's a good chat. Maybe we can have a we can have a top up later, a month or two from now, just to see I'm how it's to. all going. Because I think I think you know it's all moving so fast. Uh, you know, it's very hard to keep track of what's happening politically, health wise, technology wise. It, it's very hard. And, um, and I think it's been interesting talking to you just from the, because obviously you've got the details of people's, the, the mobile stuff, what's happening a little bit in the kind of entrepreneurial world in San Francisco. Uh, and it's hard to know everything, right? But it's good to, to know some of that data. But it's been a, it's been a good chat, Henry. Um, where can people find you? Maybe you could tell us your, your business domain name or how they can get hold of you. Yeah, sure. So if people want to reach me on social media, I'm at, SF Mocha, S F M O C A on Twitter. And if you're, you have a mobile app and you want a, a really great solution to figure out if your advertising campaigns are making money for you, go to www.tengin, T E N J I N dot I O. Tengin dot I O. What does Tengin mean? It's the Japanese god of knowledge. I like it. Now that's why we've got to end this, this uh, interview. Thank you very much, Henry. <laughs> Have a good evening. We'll speak soon. Cheers. Okay.